seven games left. How, how do you feel about where things are, and especially the togetherness and, and things like that? Moving down? Incredible. Uh, thankful. I have so much respect for our guys' willingness to change, their willingness to change and try to do it together. I thought we played real hard last night. Um, I think they're accepting of how narrow the path is for us to have a chance to win and still have the toughness to try to follow that path. I think that's real hard. I think that's rare anymore uh, to see when you know so much is stacked against you and you're still willing to try. And so, uh, yeah, I'm very thankful uh, to be five and six. We've won three road games. I think uh, that's always a clue. Yeah, so, yeah, very thankful. I know the defense is or aimed at making sure they take those corner threes, low percentage shots. Does it surprise yep. you the kind of runs that some of these teams have gone on, like LSU, South Carolina last night, that it's like they, sh they should be low percentage? Yeah, um, I guess, you know, for every cause there's an effect, and for every effect there's a cumulative effect. And that's kind of what the premise of it is, like what you're saying. Uh, can we force you to shoot more threes than the game plan says you want to? Can we make sure that those threes are contested? We haven't been perfect at that all the time. And then – uh, maybe a byproduct of it, Travis, is, is it shortens the game. Our defense shortens the game, which is on that narrow path that we need to be on. South Carolina here for sure uh, is an outlier relative to their percentages, their team, and our team's defense. Um, but if 55% of the shots have been taken from behind the three-point arc, we've forced more threes than any team in the league. Um, yeah, it's just playing the numbers, not, not that we're betting, we're against betting, but <laughs> if you're studying the numbers, the numbers say this is the best approach. Um, I think I may have told you this when you asked in the fall, since the shot clock era, began, we forced more threes last season than any college basketball team. The problem that our group is having now, like last night, they missed 25 balls, but they got 14 of them back. That's hard for us to overcome. It would be hard for any team to overcome. We didn't force as many threes as we want. They did get to the paint too often, like you asked last night. But if we could have like a shell, that's what we call, you know, like a protective, invisible shell, and they don't get inside that shell, then it's going to be a, a contested three, we hope. And now the game becomes, can we finish the possession? And what ends up happening is, is if Travis shoots it on the left and Travis misses it, that means the ball, statistically speaking, is going to land on the right. And that's where we're getting beat. And sometimes we get beat over there because we had to do everything possible to protect the shell so that the shot did come from three on the left side. And so we're outnumbered on the right side. And it's almost like um, words we use, run step. As the ball moves, we're run stepping towards the pass. And it's almost like we have to run step towards the shot. So you shoot it from the left, and we all need to run step towards the right. And uh, in the games where we've had a high percentage of finishing the possession, we typically have a chance. When those numbers or those percentages are low, it, it just breaks our back. If we can shoot more field goals than the opponent, we, we for sure have a chance. If we're in the range, we for sure have a chance. And the way that happens is we're not giving them extra possessions and we're not playing with a high turnover rate. 
Like we only had 11 turnovers last night against a really good team. Three turnovers uh, from Nebo, atypical. Three turnovers from Jay in a very short amount of time. That's over half of our turnovers. So last night the problem wasn't turnovers relative to field goal attempt numbers. Last night it was they uh, got whatever that number is, 56% of the balls they missed. Can't do that. I think you called him an offensive savant last night, Coach mm-hmm. Green. Yeah. What did you learn in that, that kind of one year from him? Do you look forward to playing friends like that, or, or is it something you maybe rather? Uh, yeah, I would prefer not to. Um, you know, when Coach hired me, uh, you know, when I, when I left here, I know you know this, uh, when I left here to be a head coach, Excited for the chance, not necessarily thinking that I ever would get a chance. In hindsight, probably not the job you want to take after a hurricane. And I worked there 365 days and resigned. And um, I did not know Coach Kareem. And that's why I'm so thankful that he hired me. Didn't know me, not from that part of the country. Didn't know any players, coaches. Um... And then I was actually in Texas, Joe Fulce, who's on my staff, who signed at Texas A&M, eventually articulated to Marquette, um, signed with me at New Orleans. I was in Tyler when uh, they called me to come back to Milwaukee. And I came back to Milwaukee. and that was when Coach was making a decision if he was going to take the Indiana job. And should not, by any stretch of the imagination, I was 34, was 14 and 17 as a head coach. Marquette's a top 15 job, basketball job. Every year, no matter who the coach is, the support, the tradition, the resources. Um, but in that seven and a half months that I worked for coach, um, had really good players and just his, his brain is just wired. You know, like I've studied coach Fisher, um, and I don't know a lot about football, but I think his offense has a lot of layers to it. And I think it requires multiple players to make decisions relative to what the defense allows. That's just a fan's perspective. Coach Crean is kind of like that from a basketball lens. It's not, it is a lot of plays, more plays than anybody in the SEC, but it's, if this doesn't work, remember we got this on the backside. And if they're defending the ball screen like this, we attack it like that. And I had never seen that uh, in my career as a coach. I think Coach G is very defensive-based, play incredibly hard, fundamentally sound offensively. Coach Lara, who I worked for at Colorado State, kind of a balance on both ends of the floor. So I had never seen an offensive-centric head coach. Um, And it was coming off what I thought was career suicide. That's what the media said when I left New Orleans. You know, you're 34 years old and you quit as a head coach with a losing record, you're probably not gonna get another chance. And so uh, I don't enjoy playing him or anybody that I had relationships with for a long time. It's just, uh, yeah, not comfortable with it. Coach, what's the the key to slowing down an offensive player like Edwards who can stretch the defense, get to the rim? I know it's not easy, but is there one thing yeah, you got to do? Um, at Georgia, we for sure didn't do that. Um, we didn't slow him down off the catch, off the bounce. I think he had uh, – did he have 15 rebounds? Led the game. Yeah, like he was just – like we were at a different level. It's like a monster. Yeah, not in a, not in a good way. I don't think one player can stop – him or any other elite level guard because they're so crafty with the ball and they can gain space. And so it's not just um, who's guarding the ball, it's the next to us defenders relative to the gap. And uh, obviously we didn't do that at Georgia, but 
How can the guy on the ball make him uncomfortable enough that he's going in the direction of one of the two guys that's in the gap? And now uh, that gap pressure and because he's uncomfortable with the ball pressure to some degree makes him have to give it up. And then you can't give a player that's as talented as he is at scoring the ball vision because now he can score and make the game easier for someone else. And so we did none of what I just said, but I would think that that's probably the best approach. How did you, when did you begin at the analytics and, and the analyzing of the numbers? Was there a coach that, that kind of spurred you in that direction? Yeah, I, I've just tried to do a really good job of being transparent with you guys, um, not so that I don't know what you, I don't even know where you got. I know he works for the local paper and he works for the Chronicle and he works for Tex Ags, but um, I try not to say numbers too much because I never want it to come across as if uh, I'm smart or I know all the answers. I think it's just uh, as I grew up, that was how I learned was through evidence, through evidence of numbers. And I know you can skew numbers however you want. How, uh, this is too long of an explanation, but how it started was um, if the ball touches the paint, this started at Marquette. Uh, there was a kid that was a student that started a Twitter and blogger and it turned into paint touches because that's what I was always saying. Right. Uh, that's how it all started and it was, um, I had studied teams that advanced in the NCAA tournament and what the percentage of their field goal percentage when the ball didn't touch the paint versus the percentage of when the ball touched the paint prior to an attempt. Yeah. And it was 22% different. Mm -hmm. And so I just kept studying and studying and studying, which became a lot of the defensive based, well, don't let it touch the paint. and. Um, I think as I evolved as a coach, it was one way that I tried to teach our guys how we wanted to play. And I think anytime you're teaching, the best way to help someone is so that they understand the why. And so we use the numbers to teach the why of why we do what we're doing. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Coach.